Okay, everybody. Online world is now with us. Welcome in to ME 2002, your new favorite class. Okay. Um, I'll be the instructor for the course. Uh, I recognize a lot of faces here in person and also in the online world. So welcome to everybody who's here. Um, let's make a couple of announcements for the class first. Obviously, we're kind of in this weird COVID situation, so I'm doing the hybrid uh, delivery style. Um, so you can join virtually or come in person. Um, if you're going to come in person, please wear a mask and please come at sort of like the designated times on um, the syllabus by last name. So you can see we're actually almost already full in the room here. So I think we are going to have to do kind of like the 50 50 split. So I wish I could see all of you every single day, but it doesn't seem like that's maybe going to work out. So um, if you want to have the in person experience, please come. Would love to have you. Otherwise, um, if you want to stay online, that's also just fine. OK, um, I'll be using Canvas for this course for uploading all materials. So you should have gotten an email from me and you should have access to the Canvas, Canvas site. If you don't, please let me know um, and we'll get you access. I've uploaded a couple pieces of information there already, including the syllabus for the class, the first set of notes and the common equation sheet for the class. So please make sure that you can sort of see all those. I just added those as modules. So make sure that you can go and, and take a look at those. Um, I will be recording all the lectures online here and uploading them to my YouTube page, usually within like 24 hours. Um, and so I uploaded a, a link to my YouTube page if you want to go ahead and um, either subscribe or just go to that link and use that link if you need to sort of like miss a class and, and catch a lecture later. OK, so that's that. Um, this is a strange class for me because I've never had a two hour actual lecture before. So I've had two hour labs before where we kind of like you know, for ME 190 or whatever, and I think that's a little bit more common for a lab class, but I haven't really had like a two-hour lecture before. So um, all the studies show that you lose interest after like 30 minutes, so we'll see what happens after, you know, 120 minutes. It's a little suspicious, but uh, I'll try my best to like sort of keep people involved and entertained, and we'll do a lot of practice problems so you're not just sitting there getting a bunch of droning on and lecturing and blah, 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 okay? So I'll do my best to try to like spice up the two hours, but Sometimes we might just have to lecture for like 45 minutes, 60 minutes straight. So I know it's not really pleasant, but um, I really will try my best to, to, to be a little bit more active. OK, um, on the agenda today, we're going to talk about the syllabus. I know you probably have like syllabus every day and, you know, you want to. Um, it's a little bit boring to talk about the syllabus every class that you go to, but we got to get through it just so that we all know we're on the same page. And then we'll start in on the notes for the class, um, which will be on friction to start. It's like this gateway between am I moving, am I not moving? You know, it's like friction. I'm right on the border, like about to move. So about to go from statics to dynamics. Okay. I think it's kind of cool. All right, so let's um, let's do this. Um, the way that this is going to work, like I said, it's hybrid online. And I'm going to share um, on the whiteboard here in the classroom exactly what people in the online world are seeing with my sort of writing pad. So. Both of you guys, whether you come in person or whether you're watching online, you're going to get the same stuff. So um, it's not different being in person or being online. All right, I'm going to try my best to sort of make that as consistent as I can. All right, so here we go. Syllabus time. Yes, I know you're all pumped. Um, this is ME 2002. Um, if you were not expecting that, you're expecting something else. Uh, sorry. Uh, I'm uh, Dr. Hart. My office is in the science building. It's right across from the foundry. So if you've sort of been in the science building, I know maybe not lately, but um, I'm right across from the foundry on the second floor. Uh, I can't really have anybody in my office, but you can knock on the glass and wave if you want. <laughs> okay. Um, my phone number is listed there. I will pick up the phone and, and answer if you call. Most people don't really like that these days. Um, Email is probably preferred, um, but if you call, I'll, I'll pick up and we can chat about, you know, whatever. I have office hours every single day, 8 to 9.30. I like to have a very consistent office hour every day, so you can't be like, oh, is it Tuesday, is it Wednesday, whenever the office, every day, 8 to 9.30 a.m., okay? You should have all been invited to my office hour team, so you can just use that chat to just like say, hey, can we start a chat, or can I just ask you a question in the, you know, the text box right there or whatever, sure. Okay, if you're like struggling with stuff, please come to office hours and ask me questions. I, I am there um, every single day, 8 to 9.30, okay? So class meetings are going to be Tuesdays, Thursdays. This two-hour window from 4 to 5.50. It's a little bit late, I know. Um, I'll bring like, you know, foam bricks to throw at you when you're sleeping. No, I'm just kidding. I won't do that. Um, I'll, I'll do my best to try to keep it involved, all right? 
come um, the day that prescribed if you want to come in person. Um, otherwise, this class can be attended fully online if you'd like. We got two textbooks for the course. Um, the statics book you should have, hopefully. Did you guys just, like, most of you come right from statics? Took statics last, last quarter, most of you? Yeah, okay. Um, so uh, you probably have this first book here, uh, and then the second book in the sequence, it's a very similar looking book, this dynamics book. Um, I do advise you to get the book, though I would say it's not an, a hard requirement because as you'll see, I sort of make my own PowerPoint slides and make my own notes and you can get by with just my notes. I'll tell you that. So if you want to save a little bit of money, cool, but I generally would advise you to buy the book because there's a lot of actually good stuff in the book, extra practice problems and all that sort of stuff if you want to like learn more material. All right. Course description, it's your second course in the mechanic sequence coming right from statics. Things are about to move now no longer F equals zero, some of the forces now equals mass times acceleration. So we got some motion in the ocean. So a little bit more exciting this time around, we're gonna talk about motion in this class. All right, we've got a couple of like massy precursors that we need to sort of get out of the way at the beginning of this class, things like centroids, area moments of inertia, um, and some friction concepts before we really get into motion. And that's more or less what we're going to focus on before Christmas break. And then after Christmas break, we're really going to hit the, the motion side of things hard. Kinematics, kinetics, etc. Okay, so that's kind of what's happening in this class. All of you should have had Calc 2, 190, um, 1601, and your Mechanics 1, obviously. If not, or you're sort of like co-enrolled in one of those things, maybe send me an email and, and maybe we can talk about it. All right, prerequisites. You should all know how to do free battle diagrams at this point. Vector mechanics, derivatives, and integrals. Those shouldn't be out of the. Those shouldn't be too much of a crazy ask. All right, here's your schedule for the class. Um, we got a bunch of uh, topics that we're going to hit before Christmas break. I think a lot of people are trying to squeeze in an exam right before Christmas break. I just don't think that that's going to be possible for us. All right, so I typically like to do three exams for this class, but this time around I'm actually only going to do two in-class exams and one final. And it's just because I just don't feel comfortable only having like five lecture periods before the first test. I just don't think that like that's enough. So um, hopefully you don't lose all of the information in your heads um, over the holiday break. And since I'm doing in-class exams, they're going to be two hour exams, right? Because we got two hours in this window. And that allows me to maybe test on five weeks worth of material instead of like three weeks of material. OK, so there's your exam schedule one a week five, one a week 10, and then you'll also have a, a final exam. It's unclear to me whether or not the final is going to be a common final. So maybe you do or do not know this, but typically this class has a common final. That means that the final is the same final for all sections of the class. So, you know, I'm teaching a section and there are other people that teach this course as well. Typically we would have a common final, but I think because of like COVID situation, we're not doing that this quarter, though that may be a little bit like TBA. OK, so as I sort of know this and figure this out, I'll let you guys know. But as of this point, I think that I will be writing both the in-class tests and the final. OK, if it is a common final, somebody else will write it. OK, so just keep that in mind. All right. Grading for the class. I am like as lenient on the grading as I possibly can be, um, as possible as like the department allows me. So I'm your typical like 90 to 100 is an A, 80 to 87 is a B. 87 to 100 or 87 to 90 is a b the typical like pretty loose grading scale all right so there you go um two in class exams like i said each were 25 finals were 30. you have some simulations in this class so simulations are kind of like computer assignments maybe did you guys have simulations for 2001 yeah some of you did some of you didn't like they supposedly took the simulations out of the curriculum but i still think that some people had them in 2001 so it's a little bit strange but um, I definitely know that they're a part of this class. So we'll have simulations in this class with MATLAB. Um, so look for those to come. Either two or three, uh, a little undecided at this point. All right. If you have issues with grading, sometimes it comes up. I need it in writing what your objection is and why you think you should get more points. All right. If you just send me an email saying, hey, you took off 8,000 points for this minus sign, I think that's unreasonable. I'll probably be like, okay, yeah, it's probably unreasonable. All right, so send me an email and tell me what's up. I'll look at it again. If you still disagree, you can appeal to the chair. All right. So like I said, for this course, course policies, um, I'll be simulcasting from this room. I'm in Dirk's Hall 323 right now. Uh, so that's where I'm simulcasting from. 
uh, I would encourage you to come in person if you're comfortable with that. I think it's just like a better learning environment to be in person as much as you can. Um, but if you want to take this class fully online, you can also do that as well. OK, uh, I'm going to record these lectures. I'm recording this lecture right now and I'm going to post it to my YouTube page, usually within 24 hours, usually within like an hour or so, actually. Um, so take a look for those if you have to miss a class. All right. I encourage you to watch actually live in person. It's a little bit more interactive, but if you got to miss, you got to miss. It, it happens. All right. Simulation projects coming using MATLAB, like I said. All right. Homework problems. You're going to get maybe, I don't know, seven homework sets throughout the quarter. The way that I do homework is I assign usually like four or five problems. I will give you the answer for all the problems. All right. So I'll assign a problem and give you the answer. Bam. Why do I do that? Well, I'm not going to give you the full workout solution, but I'll tell you like where you're aiming for. OK, and so if I give you the answer, it helps you with your thought process of like, you know, I got to try this problem. If I don't get this answer, there's something wrong. OK, so if you just blindly do a homework problem and you don't know what you're sort of like shooting for, then you might miss the target and think that you've done well. All right. Giving you the answer sort of gives you that guidance that like, OK, maybe I made a mistake. I need to figure out what I did wrong. So I give you the answer, but your homework problems need to show me how you got the answer. You can't just like put, you know, Bob Dylan, your name and 24 is the answer. I'm going to be like, OK, let's, what is this? OK, um, give me the full workout solution. All right. So the way I deal with homework is I'll assign four or five problems and then I'll grade one at random which will be the basis for 80% of the grade of the homework. OK, then I'll look for the rest of the problems and make sure you did them. And that'll be the remaining 20% of the problem. So if you want to play Russian roulette and do like one of the five homework problems, you're like, I hope this is the one he grades. Like, you know, good luck to you. All right. So I'll say that. Um, good luck. Yeah, I've had people do that in the past and sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't. All right. Um, you're going to hand in your homework virtually. You want to email me your solutions prior to lecture the day that it's due. So I will probably post a homework on friction, if not tonight, probably tomorrow. That'll be due next Tuesday. So you'll have to get me your solution on the friction homework by the beginning of lecture next Tuesday. All right. So 4 p.m. next Tuesday in my email inbox. Uh, formatting, just make your stuff look nice. OK. I always get like a student or two that has like try to fit the entire homework on like one piece of paper and I got a free body diagram in the corner that's like this big and you like can't read anything and you're just like, oh my gosh, it's like use more paper. All right, use more space. You got all this like space, just use the space. All right, so make big solutions, big pictures and all that sort of stuff. All right, you don't go to an engineering drawing at some company and every drawing is like this little tiny little big and it's like you can't read anything. Okay, so make it nice and big, make it legible, etc. Okay. Exams, two in-class exams. Um, I can't patrol the exams. They're going to be virtual, and so I'm just letting you have whatever you want. You want to use MATLAB? You want to use your calculator? You want to use the internet? Fine. Okay. I'm telling you, the exams are going to be somewhat difficult. So if you don't know what you're doing, it doesn't matter if you got the internet. <laughs> you're gonna you're gonna bomb. All right. So you still got to know what you're doing going into it, or you're gonna be in in danger land. Okay. Um, so that's how I'm going to handle the exams. They'll be virtual on Teams. So days that we have exams, come virtually to Teams, set up your you know home office, whatever you got to do. We'll have the exams uh, virtual. Turn your camera on. Let me see what you're doing um, on your work, and um, that's how the exams are going to go. All right. Makeup exams not possible. Um, so unless you have some seriously legitimate excuse, um, you can consider a makeup exam not really a possibility. Uh, the time and date for the final is set by the registrar later in the term. I don't really know what or when the final is going to be, so don't make any plans to like travel home early or anything like that. Okay. On to cheating. If you cheat, I will give you a zero in the class and you'll fail. That's it. Okay. So if we're doing simulations and you like copy and paste someone's computer code as your own and you just change like one or two of the variables, you're out. You're done. Okay. I, I just have no tolerance. Okay. Don't do it. I don't mind if you like work on homework with somebody else and you like have similar looking solutions that get to like, you know, some some similar answer. That's OK. I, I'm, I encourage that. That's fine. But if you're like working a simulation and you copy paste someone else's code, and it's like basically line by line the same except for one or two variables. You're done. OK, you're out. F. All right. This is your warning. Please don't do it. Um, if I watch you on the camera while you're doing your exam and 
you know, I can see that someone else is in the frame, like doing some math for you or something. I, I, I'm not even going to mess with it. You're, you're done. You're out. OK, if you want to appeal to the chair after that, fine. OK, but I'm, I'm not messing around. All right. D like we have you have a lot more opportunity to cheat these days because of like this virtual situation we got going on. And so if I just like sense it or smell it at all, like you're done. OK, so don't even like don't even try. Don't don't try. It. All right say is you know this is like I think this is kind of an exciting time like for you guys I think about like when I was your age and I was like going through the mechanic sequence it was like that time that sort of like reaffirmed that engineering was like the right thing for me okay it's like you know statics you're you're looking at these diagrams you're like oh finally we're doing like vector math and this actually like means something now like I understand a, a force is a vector being applied to this thing and it's static and it's got this internal forces and moments and you know you're applying all these math tools that you've had in your tool bag for you know a decade plus you're finally applying them to like real stuff okay you've got all this MATLAB hardware and tools that you've been putting in your tool bag for the last year you've got the statics background and you're finally seeing forces and stuff and real action and real engineering application you're doing homework problems where it's like a gear system and it's like wow this is actually something real and tangible and useful not like do 5,000 integrals on this stupid math homework and you know why am i doing these integrals over and over okay so i hope that you feel excited about this topic because it's actually like engineering and application now finally you know so you've been building your tools you've been building that math you've been building that physics now let's let's use it baby okay it's time so um you saw a little bit of that in statics you're going to get a little bit more of it now i hope it, it it like excites you a little bit okay um last thing here they've asked me to include some information about covid um please wear a mask if you come here over the nose and and the mouth i'll yell at you if you're not um i won't yell at you but i'll firmly ask you to please cover both your nose and your mouth when you're wearing a mask and do your best to sort of like maintain the distance you guys are doing a good job right now so um just sit where they sort of tell you to sit in the classroom i guess that's what they do. all right if you're feeling sick don't come, don't come to class um you, you know use your use your judgment okay any questions on the syllabus as i have laid it out i know syllabus week's a little bit like boring and slow but um any questions how are we doing? You guys all have able to access Canvas? That was all okay? Yes, good, all right. Did you get my office hours invitation? Are you guys like cool on that? Like on the teams there? Um, you look like maybe not. Oh, okay. Um, check to see if you have like um, access to the Dr. Hart office hours on teams, okay? All right, online world, questions, questions? Nope, I don't see anything in the chat. All right, good. Well, if there is no further ado, I hate ado. Let us um, do some dynamics. <laughs> Let us uh, do some dynamics. <laughs> uh. Okay, so the way this is gonna go, um, if you're in Teams right now, you should see sort of like what looks like a whiteboard or a writing pad. Uh, but I'm gonna mostly use this writing pad for lecturing and it's just gonna be like the whiteboard. And the people in the class see the exact same thing as the people uh, uh, online see. And my lecture notes are gonna more or less follow the PowerPoint slides that I have provided on Canvas. So whether you like to sort of follow notes by hand uh, you know, on your own piece of paper, or if you like to have like the PowerPoint slides in front of you and make notes on that, or if you like to just sort of follow the PowerPoint slides without making any notes on your own and just sit there and digest stuff, whatever your learning style is, hopefully, um, we can sort of accommodate you here, okay? So, um, if there are no additional questions, let us get on with it. I think I'm gonna try to like give you guys a break too at like, you know, five o'clock or something. Like 60 minutes is like, you know, it's not when the head bobbers, the head knobs kind of come in. You're like, oh, falling asleep. All right, so hopefully this works. Yay, it does work, all right? So let's try it. Um, anytime I've lectured in the past, I've been sitting. Uh, so we'll see how the handwriting goes. Um, maybe I'll have to figure out a way to sit here, but the stand, uh, I'll try. Um, so let's do it. Friction. Yeah, I can already tell that this is not going to be great. <laughs> yeah, there's a button that makes it go down. I was trying to like get it up high enough where I can stand because I feel like standing, I'm a little more animated and a little bit more like engaged. So I, I, I like the idea of standing. So maybe I'll try standing today, and if I don't like it, maybe I'll go to the sitting on. On, on Thursday. Okay, 
so away we go with friction. So I like friction because it's kind of like this in between of like statics and dynamics. All right, so in statics, everything is just sitting there and you're analyzing all the internal forces on this body and you know some of the forces is equal to zero. And friction is like, all right, we're putting enough force on this thing where it's like resisting my motion by some friction on the ground or whatever the case may be. And it's like just about to move. So we're just like in this like interim zone between dynamics and statics where it's like this, this, this border uh, between moving and not moving. OK, so let's put some uh, like actual definition to this and, and we'll talk about this as sort of an introduction. All right. All right. So generally, when we talk about friction in this class, we're going to talk about friction forces. All right. And so friction forces are tangential forces that sort of develop. That oppose impending motion or that impose uh, sort of like oppose uh, potential motion of an object. OK, so let's put some definition to that. OK, so uh, we'll talk about friction forces. Yeah, OK, I already don't like this. We're going we're, we're going to the sitting. So so high tech. OK. OK. All right, I think I'm ready now. OK, so let's talk about friction. First thing we'll talk about is friction forces. Um, and friction forces are sort of like these forces that act to sort of oppose motion or it, oppose impending motion. So we'll say that these are tangential forces. Um, which develop. when moving or about to move along a rough surface. Okay, the classic example is like the box on a on a plane. Okay, so an example is this like classic example where you have some like flat plane. Here I'm putting these lines here to denote that it's like some flat ground. And you've got some like box that's resting on the ground. Okay. Some box. All right. Now uh, this box has some weight associated, so maybe we put some vectors on here for the internal weight of the object, sort of acting at the middle. Wait, and if I were to cut away the floor, um, I would have to, if this thing is not moving, so let's say stationary. Okay, if this thing is not moving, then to balance this thing out with equilibrium, obviously we have to have some normal force, let's call it capital N, that sort of opposes the weight of the box to keep this thing stationary, All right? Now, let's say that I am moving the box or I want to move the box to the right. OK, well, anybody that's moved anything in their life before knows that you can apply some force to the side of the box to push the box along the plane and move it. OK, so if we want to move it. So let's say motion. I still have my same sort of flat plane. And I've got my box now. I still have that weight of the box acting downward. And I still have the normal force that's acting upwards. Now, if I want to move this, I'm going to apply some force to it. Maybe I'm trying to move it to the right. And so let's apply some force. And let's call that force capital P. All right. Now, if the surface is not frictionless, OK, so let's say that the surface is rough. Then there's going to be some force at the interface between the surface that's going to act to oppose this motion. You know, anyone that's sat on a chair understands this. Anyone that's tried to push a box in their life sort of understands this. 
Okay. And so we label this as the friction force, usually with the capital letter F. And in this situation, it's going to oppose the motion or the impending motion. Now, I haven't talked about whether the force P is enough force to get this to move or not. We're going to talk about that a little bit later. But let's just say that there's some small amount of force P that's acting on this guy in the boxes, maybe not yet moving or it's got impending motion. And it's going to result in some resistive force from that motion, which we call F. And this here is the friction force. Okay, it's a force that's acting to oppose motion. All right. So where is this coming from? Um, well, why does friction develop in the first place? All right, well, it mostly develops because surfaces are imperfect. All right, just like my personality, it's imperfect. All right, you got all these ridges, you've got all this imperfection at the micro scale between the two different objects, where object A isn't fitting perfectly into object B at the micro scale. And so when you try to push one against the other, there's some maybe like interlocking of the two objects that's happening on like a molecular scale right at that interface. Okay, so we'll say here that friction mostly comes. Um, from the following, uh, irregularities in the surface. Let's actually spell it out. Um, so this could be things like um, material roughness, let's just say. I'll generally call this the quote roughness. And you might think about sandpaper as a good example, right? Sandpaper's got like basically sand at the interface. And so it has all these nooks and crannies and all these like imperfections on the surface that allow it to be very like sticky if you try to like slide anything across it, right? Um, and at very small scales, you can have some like molecular friction. So when you want to think about like Van der Waals forces or um, some other atomic forces that might be at play between the interfaces, this can actually cause friction as well if you're moving from like, you know, through pathways of atomic interaction, you can have various levels of interaction and friction there. Okay, so that's a little bit outside the scope of this class. We're not trying to get into like the physics of atoms at that sort of molecular level, but they are forces that could exist at that level. So we'll just say molecular interactions. You know, we're mostly focused on uh, that guy. Right. And when it we talk about friction, um, your book classifies it in two ways, um, into what's called dry and uh, lubricated or, or, or fluid friction. Um, so two types. Dry friction. Um, this is the friction you're probably like most familiar with, and it's um, friction between rigid bodies. We'll just say friction between bodies, solids, and we could also have fluid friction. And fluid friction involves some sort of lubrication. And that's probably going to be a topic better reserved for your fluid mechanics class. OK, so. So friction with lubricated surfaces. All right. So we're not talking about this much in class, but it is sort of a classification that exists. Um, maybe you'll talk about that in a fluids class. The general field of study of friction, which is actually a pretty complicated field, is something called tribology.
bonus fact not in your notes, OK? Tribology, T-R-I-B-O-L-O-G-Y. All right, so you want to get a PhD in tribology, you'll be a well-paid individual, let's just say. OK, now I'm going to bring up a picture here that you probably should have seen in your statics class. And it's a picture that talks about the reaction forces that develop at like frictionless or rough surfaces. OK, so I'll bring this slide up here and let's just kind of talk about this quickly. So you should have seen um, maybe pictures uh, like this, and maybe it's better if I just bring this into the notepad and we'll just talk about it directly. Um, so here. Um, let's talk about frictionless and rough surfaces. All right, so maybe you saw a diagram that looked something like this in your statics class, where you're talking about the various types of boundary conditions for a bar or a reaction and sort of the forces that are associated with that um, boundary condition. So for instance, like rollers and rockers, they each have sort of like a one reaction force that are associated and a frictionless surface is just going to resist force in sort of like this one direction. All right. Contrast that with like a rough surface where you have obviously the force that stops it from going through the surface, this like vertical force, but you also now have this horizontal force. And so I want to draw your attention generally to this force here, which if you're talking about a rough surface, this here would be like your friction force. All right. So when we're talking about friction, we have this like, again, unknown sort of reaction force that we have to sort of account for. And so you sort of already seen this with your statics class, or maybe you, maybe you talked about this directly, maybe you didn't in your statics class, but um, it's something that's important to know. So if I have a perfectly smooth surface, like I think about this pen on, you know, this table that I have right now, this table is like relatively smooth. So I feel like, you know, even when I drag this pen across the surface, there's not a lot of like friction force resisting the motion of my pen here. You know, I don't really have a lot of resistance to me pushing the pen just in this general direction with this like smooth surface. But if I got down on the carpet and tried to push my pen across that carpet, that would be unpleasant. I wouldn't be able to really push it as easily as I do when I'm across the table because we have this like various degrees of roughness or smoothness of the surface. OK, and so your statics book is like a sit. It deals in absolutes. All right. It says it's either rough or it's smooth. But in reality, there's this like whole gamut of in between, right? Where my pen is, yeah, mostly smooth on this surface and would be mostly rough on the floor. But there's like this whole gamut of in between of like a sandpaper would be more aggressive than this carpet. And like, you know, the carpet's more aggressive than this smooth table, right? So there's like this whole gamut that exists. And we have to be able to talk about that, not only qualitatively like I am now, but with some quantitative discussion. OK, so uh, up to now, you've seen perfectly rough and perfectly smooth surfaces. OK, the reality is that there's this like gamut. OK, but if it's frictionless. I'll put this in quotes. I'm still having problems with like uh, writing at this height. I'm going to have to do some adjustments later, but it'll it'll get better. Um, if frictionless, we basically have no resistance to motion in these directions. All right, so no. Tangential force is present. All right. This is like your ideal situation in your statics book where there's no reaction force to stop my pen from moving. And so um, objects 
will move freely against each other. Okay, it's like a sheet of ice is like as close as you can sort of possibly get. All right, and so if rough, then here tangential forces develop. And must account for friction. Okay. So, like I said, you had kind of seen some of this in your 2001 class, all right? But we're going to do a much deeper dive on it now. And it's because friction forces that develop, they can develop whether the object's moving or not, all right? And so when you're in your statics class, you're mostly talking about like a rough surface providing enough resistance so that the object is not moving. It's what you like would assume for a rough surface in statics. But here in dynamics, it's not necessarily assumed that we're not going to move. We're perfectly okay with motion in this class. We're stepping up our game, all right? So frictional forces are going to develop on a rough surface whether it's moving or not. So we have to be able to talk about that, all right? So let's um, look at this in a little bit more detail. All right. First, let's talk about the static friction force. All right, now let's go back to our uh, classic box example. We'll say, in reality, no two surfaces in contact are perfectly rough or smooth. Okay, there's some like medium that, that exists, right? Let's go back to the box, box example. All right, so for our box example, we have this general situation going on. We've got our weight, W. We've got our normal force, N, assuming that we're going to cut away the ground. And we've got some force that's pushing this. That's P. And we've got some resistance to that force that's pushing us against the ground. That's the friction force, F. Okay? So this horizontal P force, P, induces this frictional force, F. F would not exist without P, right? Now let's see what would happen if we sort of plotted the value of f as a function of sort of the value of p. So let's let's talk about this. Plot the frictional force f versus the value of p. So let's make a graph here and, and talk about that. Okay. So here's my applied horizontal force p. Here's my frictional force, F. We all know from real life that if you're pushing something and it's like stuck to the ground by friction, that whatever force that you apply to it is going to be applied back to you equally if the thing is not moving. This is the basis of your statics class. So there is some amount of force that you apply that will be returned back to you up to a certain point while you're static. So we have some like linear relationship, one-to-one -one relationship that exists between these two pieces up to some point. Okay, so let's just make this a linear relationship that exists. Okay, slope of one. 
all right, an equal amount of friction force for the amount of load P that we apply while this thing is not moving. So we have to give ourselves some boundary here and say that up until the point where this is no longer moving, to the left of this line, we are static. All right, so in this region here, static. We're pushing on it, pushing on it, pushing on it, and the frictional force is pushing back, pushing back, pushing back. It's not letting us move. Then at some point, you reach the amount of force that is required to send this thing into motion. You're going to reach the amount of force that requires this thing to move. And interestingly, the amount of frictional force that you're going to have on the object resisting your motion, if you're applying some force that's small or large, as long as this thing is moving, the amount of frictional force that is going to be applied back to you is proportional to the amount of normal force that's on that surface. So if you have a refrigerator that's very heavy and you're trying to move that thing, you have a lot of friction force pushing back on you. Okay. If you have something that's relatively light, you don't have a lot of friction force pushing back on you. But regardless of um, sort of the uh, once you've overcome sort of the barrier to get that motion to go, once you apply either a little bit or a lot, that amount of friction force that's being pushed back on you is equal and constant. So at some point, you're going to overcome the barrier required to get this thing to move. And then any additional force that you push onto it is not going to affect the friction force at all. It's just going to be returned back to what it is. So interestingly, we have this sort of response where I can increase the amount of horizontal force that I want as much as possible, but the friction force that's being returned back to me is some equal value. Okay, so this is um, some constant value. And notice that there's like this little hump here. This guy. All right. Anyone that's sort of like moved a refrigerator, or moved something heavy, uh, understands and knows about that sort of like additional hump value. So I'm pushing, I'm pushing, I'm pushing. And I need just that like little oomph to get this thing to start moving. But once it starts moving, it's a little easier for me to push it. Yeah, anyone that's like sort of moved anything large sort of understands this. And the reason that is, is because when someone is, when something is like sitting on the floor, all its nooks and crannies are like locked into whatever position is on the floor that it's associated with. Okay. So you got all these nooks and crannies that are sort of like locked into all the nooks and crannies that are in this, the ground below it. Once you push that thing and it overcomes being locked in all those little nooks and crannies, it's now like floating on top of all those nooks and crannies instead of being locked in. So once you sort of like push this thing and it's sort of gotten out of its static case, it's a little easier now to push it and keep it in motion than it is to initially get it out of its static condition. All right. And so because of that, there's this like really interesting phenomena that occurs. And so we have this like reduced friction force that occurs. And so let's actually like put some words to this. Right. So prior to motion, We're static. And the frictional force F is equal to P. Obviously, okay, not moving. Just before the motion begins, this force reaches some maximum value, which we call um, F max or the, the static max force. So just prior to motion, you reach a maximum value of the friction force being some max value, F max, or I think I've labeled it in the notes as F M. All right, just after you reach this like maximum friction value, the amount of sort of frictional force that you have resisting you drops because you've kind of gotten out of that like static case where all the nooks and crannies of the refrigerator have loosened from whatever static condition they were in. All right. So 
just after motion. Friction force reduces and becomes constant. at what we call the kinetic friction force. And we label that as F sub K for kinetic. All right, so if we go back up to our picture here, this steady plateau value here is the kinetic friction force, F sub K. All right. You guys talk, you, you, you took like a physics class, yes? Did you guys talk about friction in, in your physics class a little bit? So is this like, you know, redundant from what you've learned before? Oh, man. The heck. Well, sorry about that. You're learning it again. Rawr. Okay. I promise my stuff will be harder. <laughs> okay, so this gives us a leeway to introduce coefficients of friction. I'm not getting used to this uh, sort of setup. My handwriting is not so great. I promise it will get better as I sort of adapt here. All right, so this gives me an introduction to talk about coefficients of friction. All right, the frictional force, like I said, is related to the amount of normal load that you have sort of vertically resisting, um, you know, like laying on top of that surface, okay? So I'll say friction force is linearly related to the amount of normal force between the two objects. Okay, and in math language, we write that as the frictional force is equal to, this is the Greek variable mu, times the normal force N. All right, so let's label this. N is the normal. And mu, this is the coefficient of friction. And this is the Greek letter mu, M-U, all right? It's not U, it's not, you know, Z, it's mu, it's a very specific name, all right? Don't run around calling it U, you look like an idiot. I, I have a funny story, all right? When I was in graduate school, I went to a seminar and a guy was talking about Eulerian buckling, okay? If anyone knows the name Euler, spelled E-U-L-E-R, okay, Euler. And there was a graduate student giving a presentation about Eulerian buckling, but he kept calling it Euler. And I'm like, this guy is standing up there, his whole life, his whole graduate school career is dedicated to, towards like understanding Eulerian mechanics of buckling. And he can't even say the guy's name right. Like, I have no respect for what you're saying. Like, you don't even know his name? Like, well, I'm not gonna listen to you. I'm not gonna listen to you, okay? So, the story is, don't call it you, all right? Call it mu. This is a mu, please. Okay, so Greek letter mu. Okay, back to reality. Oops, there goes gravity. All right, so the force is linearly related to the normal force, friction force, mu times n. Now, that mu, the value varies. And the value varies whether or not you have a static frictional force or you have dynamic frictional force. Okay, so let's talk about this coefficient of friction quickly and we'll talk about the differences. So, like I said, 
mu coefficient of friction. And it varies. From zero to one. Zero would be uh, perfectly frictionless. And one would be perfectly rough. OK, so what I mean by this perfectly frictionless would be no matter how heavy. Whatever it is you are you know, no matter how much normal force there is between the two objects, the amount of frictional force that develops between the two objects is zero. This is, you know, your elephant on the ice, icy lake analogy here, okay? One is perfectly rough. So something that is as light as a feather still develops a significant amount of frictional force equal to whatever the normal force is on the surface, all right? So an equivalent amount of normal and frictional force at the interface, all right? So coefficient of fr friction, varies from zero to one. So typically it'll be some percentage of the normal force at the surface, right? Now we have a couple of different coefficients of friction that exist. We're going to talk about two in this class. First is the static coefficient of friction. And that is mu sub s. And the static coefficient of friction is a coefficient of friction that is used to tell us how much force is required to overcome that static condition. So it's we're just about to begin motion and we're just about to move that refrigerator. OK, so the idea here is this is used. To calculate. Friction force. required to give motion. OK. So here we've seen this before this FM. It's the maximum amount of load that you can handle before this thing starts to move is mu sub s times the normal force. All right. So the maximum amount of force that you can handle is the static coefficient of friction times the normal force. And that is the amount of sort of force that's required to sort of like get past the static boundary, All right? So this is kind of like coefficient number one. And then coefficient number two is after you have surpassed that static condition, you're, in, you're now in this kinetic condition where it's moving and you have a different coefficient of friction here for now when it's in motion, which is going to be less than that static coefficient of friction. OK, and this is the. Um, kinetic. Coefficient of friction. And we call this mu sub K. And this is. used to calculate frictional force between objects in motion. Okay, and this is going to be, this is capital F, this is mu sub k, times the normal force. And this is probably what you're familiar with in your physics class, right? Usually, mu sub k is less than sometimes equal to the static condition. Have to be some weird stuff going on for that not to be true. All right, so I got 4.55 on my clock. Let's take a, let's take a five minute break.
five and change. Come back at 5.01 on my clock, all right? So get up, walk around, stretch your legs, et cetera. All right. Michael. Samuel and Jackie. How's life, Jackie? Haven't seen in about a year. About a year since he took 190 with me, yeah. I like to have like one ear on so I can hear people if they're talking in the chat and one ear off so I look like so I can hear what's going on in the class. Uh, every once in a while, especially like when we're doing example problems, people like chime in quite a bit. <laughs> yeah, that's a little too awkward for me. I can't I can't handle that. Yeah. <laughs> I don't I don't have that kind of like resolve that, that takes like some like gumption for that math professor to just like sit there and be like I'm not going to say anything until you start talking you know there is some like research that shows that you need to wait like 40 seconds or something for a response if you ask a question so that people can digest the question and formulate like a you know a question that they might have about the topic but man, sitting there and waiting in silence for 40 seconds, it's a long time. 40 seconds? Like, it counts to 40. Like, oh. <laughs> yeah. I guess it probably makes it a little easier because you can't see people like squirming in their chairs or something, you know? But I mean, you listen to a radio or a podcast, and if there's like two consecutive seconds of silence, you're like, is it broken? <laughs> did, like, did something happen to my radio go out? So 40 seconds, man, long time to just sit there. Doing this model where it's like half in person, half online, or like, do you guys, do you guys have like some online only classes or not? Yeah. Do you just like happen to have classes that had like all online component? Yeah. I like to like give the option because I feel like some people just go stir crazy if they're just, you know, at home for every single day and got to get out and like generally engineers are introverted, but like getting out into the world is, you know, somewhat healthy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, if if you're at home and you know YouTube is just like a click away, and you're like, oh man, let, let me watch some cat videos real quick. <laughs> this Professor Hart's kind of boring. I'm gonna watch some cat videos. <laughs> I saw one cat video the other day. I could not stop laughing. It was uh, I can't even describe it. How do you describe like a cat meme video? <laughs> Um, a cat was like pawing at a rubber band on a binder and the rubber band was like making this like bass note sound. It's like boom, boom. And this guy like tuned the, the cat playing this rubber band to like the bass line for a 1980s movie. Oh my gosh. It was ridiculous. I could not stop laughing. My fiance was like, are you, are you okay? <laughs> and I'm like, I just, this is what the internet is for. It's like stupid cat videos. That's what it was like when the internet started and it's still that way and it's just great. <laughs> uh, I mean, I get it every once in a while as like a joke. 
And usually people are very disappointed when they like deliver a pizza to Kevin Hart and it's not who they think it is. Um, <laughs> but it doesn't bother me. I mean, I, I just try to make a joke about it. I had the name before he was popular. What do you want me to say? You know? I hope you weren't expecting somebody else teaching your class. <laughs> Dr. Hart, do you know Will Smith? Uh, yeah, someone in the class just made a comment about Will Smith. Someone in the online world also said. Do you know where he was born? No, West Philadelphia, born and raised. <laughs> you guys are probably too young for Fresh Prince, but maybe not. I don't know. <laughs> he's got that new stand-up special on Netflix right now. Like he's he he did it from his house. Yeah, I watched it. I have to like keep up on Kevin Hart so I can like try to tell the jokes, but I'm not quite. A... No, no good. All right, well, hopefully I can keep your attention. All right, let's get back to it. Um, let's dive in on a couple like example cases where we sort of talk about what are the differences between this uh, static and kinetic friction here. So um, let's look at some example cases. All right, back to it. How is the size? Can you like see it? I know the handwriting is not great. I'm still kind of like adjusting to this situation. I'll, I'll try to figure something better out next time. Uh, cases. Just like at this weird angle with my wrist for this setup. I got to like, figure something else out for next time. All right. So let's look at some uh, some example cases here. Oh, I just like lost some. Just lost my power here. What? So sensitive. We've run out of power. Okay, I'm back. Apologies for that. Um, okay, uh, I've got some issue here with teams. I gotta like uh, leave and come back. Don't go anywhere. I think you're muted, Professor. <laughs> Thank you. OK, we're back. Let's look at some example cases. The first and easiest, no motion, no friction. This is just a box, a very lonely box. With its weight 
W sitting on a plane and a normal force N responding appropriately. We're not trying to push this thing. There's no force being applied to it. Pretty, pretty straightforward here. Um, we've got some weight here. We've got some normal force. And let's say that, I don't know, we've got a, an external force here, P, that's acting directly downward. All right. Um, the idea here then is that the normal force from your statics analysis would just be P plus W. Okay. Pretty easy there. Pretty simple. All right. Let's dive in on a little bit more complicated example where we have some force that's sort of, you know, we're not applying vertically anymore. We're going to be at some angle now. Okay. So let's go to case number two. We call this case number one, where we have static friction, but no motion. So here we've got our box. We're still going to have our weight on the box. That's never going to change. It's always going to kind of be this constant value of W. But now let's apply some force on this that's not um, perfectly horizontal. It's going to be at some angle. Let's say here that this is some force P. And we know from statics, that you could break this up into sort of two components of the force, which would be a Y component and an X component. So let's say we have here PY and PX. All right. And if you want little arrow directions for those guys, you can do that as well. So to resist the weight, uh, again, we're going to have some normal force. N. And we're also going to have some frictional force F. And let's now like define these things um, a little bit more carefully. Okay. Obviously, with no motion, your friction force F is just going to be equal to the X component of the force. We're not moving. So the force is simply equal to PX. Right. Since it's not moving, this force, which is equal to P of X, has to be less than the static coefficient of friction times the normal force. So both of these things together must be less than the static coefficient times the normal force, right? And the reason is we're not moving. If that horizontal force P in the X direction was greater than mu sub S times N, then you would be moving. And finally, the normal force, I think it's pretty straightforward here, is the weight plus whatever the y direction of that load is. Okay, so that's a case where we have friction but no motion. It's like this static sort of condition where you're not quite strong enough to push the refrigerator out of your kitchen. All right. Next, let's talk about static friction. But now impending motion. And this idea of impending motion has a very specific definition. And the impending motion here would then mean that the x direction of your force is equal to mu sub s times the normal force. Motion is just about to happen, baby. You've just got to that point where the x directional force is equal to that which would cause motion. So that's f sub m, what we've called it f sub max, etc. So this idea that we're still static, we're just about to move, but we haven't quite moved yet. All right. So back to your box. Still got our weight, still got our normal force. But here now we have, let's say, a more aggressive load P. 
and again, that can be sort of divided into these two components, which is like this downward force PY and this force to the right, which is PX. Not to be confused with P90X. Right? And again, we're going to have some frictional force that's resisting. But in this situation, we are just about to move. OK, we're right at the peak of that graph where we plotted like the frictional force versus the applied load P. So here we're right about to move. This is F sub M, which is equal to mu sub S times the normal force. So F M is mu sub S times the normal force, which in this situation is P ninety X. I mean PX. You guys even know what P90X is? Like the exercise videos? Seriously? Oh my gosh. No, I know what those are. They suck. Okay. Some people some people in the chat. I have one confirmation that P90X sucks and doesn't work. Okay. So thank you for uh, confirming that. Actually, I had like a roommate when I was in graduate school who did P90X and he actually kind of got kind of ripped. So good for him. I'm too lazy for that. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, um, this frictional force is the max. It's right about to hit that tipping point where it's going over the edge, right? So if we go all the way back up here and go back to our graph where we looked at impending motion, this is the point we're talking about right here. This guy right here. This is your impending motion. All right, so that's kind of the part that we're sort of talking about right now. All right. Um, so it's going to be equal to the X component of the load. We're just about to get this thing to move. All right. We still have uh, our normal force, which is going to be the weight plus whatever load we have in the Y direction. It's this still thing. All right. So we're not quite moving yet, but we're just about to. We're on like this semi unstable condition. Again, just like my personality. All right. The last piece that we'll talk about, the last sort of example we'll give is finally when we have now some friction of motion. All right, so we'll say kinetic friction. And we'll say here now motion occurring. Our box. Should I draw little speed trails behind it? Pew, pew, pew. Okay, it's moving. <laughs> it's so speedy. No, it just looks like the box stinks. Okay, some eggs in that box. Is the last example on the PowerPoint supposed to be motion occurring? Uh, yeah. So the the PowerPoint slide should say motion occurring. Here now we have P, still our similar, breaking this up into PY and P90X, which apparently you guys don't know about. Just like YouTube P90X, you'll see what I'm talking about. They got like, you know, jacked Billy Blank style people that just, you know, kicking your butt. And now since we're moving, we've overcome that sort of like barrier to entry of motion. And now we're resisting here with F sub K, this kinetic friction force, which is mu K times the normal force. Right? And in this situation, very specifically, the frictional force FK is less than PX. So we're applying more force in the X direction than my frictional force can resist. And so I'm, you know, resisting that force in the X direction, but this thing is moving. So we'll eventually get to talking about acceleration and actual uh, motion a little bit later, but important here to know that the kinetic frictional force is going to be less than the force that's being applied in the X direction. All right. And we know that FK here is going to be mu K times the normal force. So the static coefficient of friction, whatever it is. 
and I still have that my normal force, we're sort of like unaffected in the y direction, is still going to be this py plus n. Oh, sorry, plus w. So there you go. You're four different kinds of like friction and what's going on. All right, so a little bit more complicated than I think what you talked about in your physics class, yes? No? Did you talk about all this in physics? Oh my god. Why do I even, why do they even ask us to cover this if you already did it in physics? What the heck? All right, well, cool, exciting. I'm going to have a stern talking to no one about this. <laughs> All right, let's look at some example values of um, coefficients of friction. All right, so example. Coefficients of friction. All right. So this is coming right from your notes. This chart will be in your notes. Um, maybe you don't want to copy all this down by hand, but just give yourself a note if you are writing by hand that this table is in your notes, OK? Now let's just sort of talk about this, because your book gives a sort of a wide range. But you'll see that all of these are sort of like varying in value between 0 and 1. So like I told you, only Siths deal in absolutes. It's the idea here, that we only have um, a few situations where you'd have like this absolute zero or absolute one. You don't really see any zero appearing here. There's one value of one here, which is Earth on Earth. I don't even really know what that means. Sounds like a Power Rangers commercial. OK, um, but right. Um, some examples here, metal on metal ranging anywhere from 0.15 to 0.6. So if you're sliding aluminum on steel, a coefficient of friction anywhere in this range might be appropriate. Metal on wood. Similar values, metal on stone, very vague, but OK. Metal on leather. And you kind of get some general ideas here. Um, the lower the value, the more frictionless the surface would be. I wish they had some sort of um, like ice here as an example, you know, like metal on ice. That would probably be in like the uh, 0.05 range, I would have if I had to sort of guess. OK, so very near to frictionless. Interestingly, this like rubber on concrete is kind of interesting when you think about like running shoes or why do they put rubber pads on the bottom of a refrigerator? Well, here you go. This is kind of like the reason rubber generally has a pretty high coefficient of friction because it's got like this sinking into the piece sort of feeling. So it's really sort of like trying to resist your motion and has a lot of um, resistance to motion generally. OK, so friction forces are higher when you have like rubber. All right. So there you go. There's some examples. All right. Now let's talk about, um, or let's maybe just like get into an example. So there's uh, some details in your PowerPoint slides about various types of friction problems that you're gonna encounter in this class. And we're gonna do an example of each type. So I'll s just sort of give like a general idea of sort of the friction problems that you might see in this class and generally out in the world. And then we'll do some examples of each. So. Friction problems. Step number one would be like determining if an object will move. OK, these types of problems, you'll be given some information about like some applied load and what is your coefficient of friction, it's both static and uh, Probably only just static. What is your static coefficient of friction? If you apply this force, is it going to move or not? OK, it's like type problem number one. Another type of problem you'll see is um, finding required static coefficient of friction. for equilibrium. OK, this type of problem might be like, you have this box on this inclined surface. What coefficient of friction is required so that the box won't move? All right, that might be like one type of problem. See? 
And the third type of problem is, uh, let's just generally say, what required force is necessary to get this object to move? So we'll say, um, um, finding required force or other relation to create motion. So that might be like, you've got this box on this plane. What force do you have to apply to push it up the plane? Pretty straightforward. Your notes go into pretty gory detail about how to attack each one of these problems. Um, I'm not going to copy down all of those sort of like strategy slides. If you want to take a look at those, you can go ahead and do that on your own time. I'm just instead going to dive into one example problem um, today, and then we'll do some more example problems on Thursday. Okay, so let's dive in on our first example, and it'll be of type number one. So here, I'll just post this for everybody to see, and you can go ahead and copy it down, and then we'll attack it. Okay, I'm just going to copy this over to the, the white pad. So um, if, if you're copying, just bear with me. I'll get all the information down on the, on the page, and I'll bring this figure in as well. Okay, so um, I'm going to bring it in here. So here's our picture. Bang. Classic example. Brick on a plane. I'm tired of these bricks on this plane. OK. So we see that 100 pound force. Guess I don't really need to copy that down. We'll say uh, mu s is 0.25. And the coefficient of kinetic friction, mu k, is 0.2. So we're going to determine if it's in equilibrium, meaning is it stationary or is it moving? It's kind of what we mean by this equilibrium. Then find friction force. Okay, if it's in equilibrium, the friction force is whatever force is on this piece to keep it from moving. And if it's moving or about to be moving, then the friction force is just going to be mu sub k times the normal force. All right, since it's in motion, we have kinetic friction, and F is mu k times the normal force. All right. So let's go ahead and attack this, and we're going to do it um, sort of in a process of like statics at first. Let's get all our forces in place and see what's going on here. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a free body diagram. And we sort of already have that here. 
Um, if we just cut away the plane, we could imagine this happening, but I think it might be nice to actually just kind of draw it from scratch. All right. So I'm going to give myself like a reference XY sort of coordinate system here to help my life. And I'll say that sort of like the middle of this XY coordinate system is the center of the block. So I'll do my best to sort of draw this block. You guys will find that I'm not the greatest artiste, so just have to bear with me a little bit. I'm like the worst Pictionary partner ever. A shoe, a car, a giraffe. All right, we got this 100 pound force. All right, we're told that this block weighs 300 pounds. So that's gonna be right along this like Y axis. It's the weight of my piece. I cut away that incline. So there's gonna be some normal force associated with cutting away that particular surface. And then I've got some frictional force that's acting here. Now, it's a little unclear to me how I might want to draw this frictional force right now. Um, you want to predict maybe which way this thing is going to move based on sort of the problem at hand. And so if I have 100 pounds like pushing this block up, but the block weighs 300 pounds, I don't know exactly if it is going to move, whether it's going to go up, whether it's going to go down blah, blah, blah. So if you don't know, just draw your arrow for the friction force in one particular direction, and we'll see what happens with the math, and we'll let it take you there. I'm going to purposefully draw it in the incorrect direction so that we see what happens with the math, all right? Maybe you understand that a 300-pound block being held up by 100 pounds is probably going to fall downwards, and therefore your friction force should be up the plane to stop that motion. But I'm going to draw it down the plane, and we'll see what happens. just to make my uh, free body diagram sort of complete. Okay. All right, now, I've also got this little triangle um, that's sort of helping me out here with the angles of this problem. This is a three, four, five triangle. Okay. So I'm gonna label this angle right here as the angle theta. You can do some trigonometry here to determine this angle of theta. It's gonna be the tangent inverse of three on four. Right. You work this out, um, 36.9 degrees. Temperature of my heart. Okay. So uh, let's think about analyzing this particular problem. And you could analyze it using like the XY coordinate system that we have. Or you could use it in a lot of times what's helpful for these friction type problems with like block on a plane is to analyze it using like a normal and tangential coordinate system. So if we typically have like this XY coordinate system, usually these friction problems, it's a little easier to analyze using a normal and tangential coordinate system. So I'm gonna add N and T axes to this particular problem. Where here, this is the N direction. And I'm gonna call 90 degrees counterclockwise from that, the T direction, all right? Usually adding NT axis to this problem makes your life a lot easier, all right? And we'll see why in, in just a second here. All right, now to determine whether or not this thing will actually move, I'm going to assume that it is in equilibrium and determine what friction force would be required to hold it in equilibrium. Right. Now, we assume equilibrium and calculate the friction force required to hold an equilibrium. I will then compare that to the friction force which could exist in the static case and see if it's less than or greater than that value. Okay, so assuming equilibrium well, this is where our statics comes in. Some of the forces in the normal direction equal to zero, and some of the forces in the tangent direction equal to zero. All right, this is our static condition. We'll start with the normal forces. 
Let me go back up to our diagram here. Remember, we're sort of doing our analysis in like this n direction. So let's sum the forces in the n direction. We have this normal force n. We have some component of the 300 pound force that we have to account for. And the angle that exists here is the angle theta. You can confirm yourself if you'd like to do that. Right. So here we have the normal force acting in like the positive direction, right? So normal force acting in N. I'm going to add to that the contribution of this 300 pound force. So it'll be minus 300 times cosine theta. All equal to zero, some kind of keeping my analyses separate here. I can solve here then and determine that the normal force on this particular plane, 240 pounds. Hopefully we're all comfortable with that sort of analysis, nothing friction related at this point. Right? Now I'm assuming equilibrium and I wanna calculate what frictional force is required to keep me in equilibrium. All right, so let's look at the sum of the forces in the tangential direction equal to zero. And remember the way that I set up my axes is that I have sort of the tangent direction like down the plane, right? So we're going to have the frictional force that's acting in the tangential direction. We're going to have this 100 pound force that's sort of acting up the ramp, which is the negative T direction. And then we have this 300 pounds um, multiplied by the sine of theta that's going to be acting in the negative T direction, or sorry, the positive T direction. So we have to include sort of all these components. So uh, let's go ahead and do that. So we have the frictional force acting entirely in the positive T direction. Here, then I uh, have minus 100, which is sort of the force up the plane. All right. So these two guys are like opposing each other in the T direction. And then adding to this, I have uh, the weight, which is 300 pounds, times the sine of the angle that is acting in the T direction here, which is um, 36.9 degrees. This is all equal zero. Sorry about the, the room here. Can I move this over? Yeah. All right. So that's your sum of the forces in the T direction. All right, so F minus 100, minus 300, sine 36.9. equals zero. This is going to tell me that my frictional force, and let's just label it as like FREQ, it's the frictional force required to hold this thing in equilibrium, is negative 80 pounds. That's what I would find for my analysis here. All right, so this negative sign, this is telling me that sort of like drew my frictional force in the wrong way, but like I said at the beginning of the problem, I kind of anticipated that. Um, I just wanted to show what happens like with the math. All right, so let's be clear about what this value actually is. This here is the friction force required for this thing not to move. Okay, so in actuality what we need is we would need 80 pounds acting up the ramp for this thing not to move, right? Anything less than that acting up the ramp, this thing's going to start sliding down the ramp, right? Yeah, this thing is like so touchy. All right. So we're not quite done yet, all right? Let's now figure out what is the maximum sort of static friction force that we could have given the normal force that's applied and the static coefficient of friction that we have? What is friction force required for motion? Meaning, what is FM? Remember this like maximum friction force that we can handle before we start moving is mu sub s times the normal force. 
That would be the maximum friction that we can handle before it starts moving. All right, so here, Fm is mu sub s, which you were given in the problem, is 0.25 times the normal force, which we calculated above from our analysis in the normal direction. It's 240 pounds. Okay, so one quarter of 240, 60. This here is max friction force we can handle before motion. OK, what does this mean? Someone elaborate. Will it move or will it not move? It will move. Elaborate. It will move Great. because uh, 60 pounds is less than the 80 pounds. Good. So yeah, I was getting answers both live and in the headphones. Um, both people were correct, so thank you. What we've calculated from assuming that it was not moving was that our friction force needed to be 80 pounds for this not to move. What we've calculated assuming a static coefficient of 0.25 and knowing our normal force is that the maximum friction that we can handle before this thing starts to move is 60 pounds. So that means that the maximum friction force that we can get, 60 pounds, is insufficient for actually holding it in equilibrium, which is 80 pounds. So, because of this, it will move. All right. So, no equilibrium. This is the first part of the problem. Where it's asking us, is this thing in equilibrium or not? Will it move or not? No, it is not in equilibrium. So, yes, it will move. Complicated. So then what is friction force? How are we going to find the friction force then? If it's not static, it's kinetic. So how do we get the friction force? F equals MA. Yeah. Let's say what is going to be the frictional force right after it starts moving. Right, so let's assume that it's just about to move, though it hasn't accelerated yet. It's just going to be the kinetic friction, which is mu k times the normal force. Okay, so we're sliding down this, this plane. And our friction force is just the kinetic friction force, which is mu k times the normal force. So mu k given in the problem, 0 0.20, multiplied by the normal force also given in the problem, 240 pounds. So get ye to the calculator, or if you're good at mental math, you can determine that the coefficient of kinetic friction, which is the friction for this problem, is going to be 48 pounds. And let's give it some directionality. We'll say up the plane. Since we know the block will be sliding down the plane. All right, kind of a complicated example, but I think it demonstrates sort of this complicated balance between static and coefficient or in kinetic coefficients of friction and when you use each one and sort of how we tackle problems like this. All right, any questions? 
Okay, sweet. Thanks for coming. I know lectures are long, so thanks for bearing with. Um, see a new batch of you on Thursday. And the rest of you better be there online Thursday.